Okay, welcome back. This video is on section 11.3, which our book calls The Use and Abuse of Tests. And whereas the last two videos were very, very computationally intense and went through the whole inference toolbox about uh, hy um, hypothesis tests, section 11.3 is a little bit softer and just has... <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> section 11.3 has five ideas about um, hypothesis tests. So we're going to run through those ideas. And these are kind of very few kind of calculations required. The first idea is that there's really no sharp border between when you think about evidence and no evidence. And just what I mean by that is consider a p-value of 0 0.51 and a p-value of 0 0.049. This is a little bit more than 5%. This is a little bit less than 5%. Well, if 5% of our, is our threshold for kind of evidence and no evidence or statistically significant or statistically not significant, in this case, you would say you would not reject the null hypothesis. You would fail to reject. In this case, you would reject. But in reality, these numbers are so close that it just kind of seems that that's kind of the wrong thing, the wrong way to think about it. Yes, we have to have some arbitrary value for unusual and not unusual, which you said is 5%. But in practice, there's real no difference here. So, you know, think about trying to use words like, you know, technically we would reject, or there is some evidence, or there's weak evidence, or kind of something like that. But just recognize that in practice, we have to have a 5% border, but really, you know, these two things are, these two p-values are essentially the same number. So it seems unfortunate that one of them would have evidence, one of them have no evidence. So throw in some weaselly words like weak evidence, or some evidence, or something like that. The second idea is, think about the difference between what we think about as statistically significant, that kind of p-value less than 5%, and practical importance, meaning does it really make any difference in the real world? And I love this example from the book, because I think it's really kind of good. I'll let you kind of either pause and read it or go to your book. But basically you've got some kind of a cream that actually kind of is supposed to make a scab uh, fall off faster. Um, and it turns out that the average kind of scab falls off in 7.6 days. You do a whole kind of inference procedure and you put this cream and it turns out people in the cream, the average one is 7.1 days. And it turns out you do the whole process, blah, blah, blah. You get a p-value of less than 5%. Look, here it is. So sweet, we'd reject the null hypothesis. We would say actually the cream does work and it makes your scabs fall off faster. Isn't that exciting? The reality, though, is consider the difference between this number 7.6 and this number 7.1, that's 0 0.5 days, right? Would you really care if, to go to the trouble of putting on some kind of cream to make your scab fall off half a day faster? You really, practically, in the real world, you wouldn't even notice that. So this is a case where this example is statistically significant, but in the real practical world, who really cares, right? Um, think about, you know, you can imagine, now, is this, does this fertilizer make this tree grow taller? Well, if you, if the tree ended up being an inch taller, technically, yes, statistically, the tree is growing taller, but practically, no one's going to really care about a one inch taller tree. Um, so this is kind of what the math shows us, the less than 5%. This is, does not really matter in the real world? Um, this next idea, the third, third out of the five ideas is don't neglect the idea of lack of significance. And this is a case where sometimes people will actually do a problem, they'll get a p-value over 5%, and they will then say, well, my, shoot, my experiment was a failure because I did not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, that's, you still did everything correctly, and actually the fact that actually, you know, the treatment did not work or that it was not statistically significant can actually be a very, very important finding, too, in the medical industry or in science or anything else. So I don't want you to think that if you get a p-value over 5% that the experiment was a failure, because that's not true at all. And actually, um, a lot of kind of scientific journals talk about this being one of the big weaknesses of um, kind of statistics as it relates to kind of science in the real world, that people tend to not report p-values over 5% because they think that their experiment was a failure. But actually, that lack of significance can actually be as important in many cases as an experiment that actually gave you a statistically significant result. So, if you've got a p-value over 5%, report that finding, because it could be really exciting and important to somebody. Um, this next idea we've talked a little bit about, but just kind of going back, make sure you're using a good experimental design. You know, our conditions rely on things being a simple random sample. 
And think back to chapter five, we did a whole kind of study on bias and different sampling designs and different experimental designs. And it's not like you can just ignore all that and just plunge ahead with the calculations. Make sure you think about whether the data you collected was actually done in the right way. Um, there's kind of a catchphrase where good calculations can't fix bad data. If the data is bad in some way, meaning bad, meaning biased, just mention that and then you're done with the problem. Don't, don't forge ahead and kind of do the procedure and report a statistically significant result if the data was biased to begin with. Okay? This is why we spent so much time talking about that stuff uh, a while back in the experimental design in Chapter 5. If the data is bad, the data is bad, and no kind of inference procedure or calculation or calculator is ever going to fix that. Okay, the last point is something called a beware of multiple analyses. Uh, and it says multiple analyses. My handwriting is kind of bad. And what I mean by that is that let's say that your alpha value is uh, 5%. That means you should expect some unusual result about 5% of the time, right? If your threshold for what's unusual is something that should happen less than 5% of the time, just by random chance or random variation, well then, yes, you'll expect a rand an unusual result about 5% of the time. Thinking about it, that means if you run your experiment 20 different times, over and over again, multiple times, on average, you should expect one unusual result. And that means, you know, if you, if, even if your null hypothesis is what it is, um, if you run the experiment 20 times, you'll get one time where your p-value is less than 5%, because that's what the 5% means. It's the probability just happens by random chance. So, out of 20 times, you know, 5% of the time, you'll get that random chance. What I mean by that is you can't just run your experiment over and over and over again waiting for the one p-value less than 5% and then say, hey, sweet, my experiment worked, right? You should not suddenly claim your experiment was significant if you get one unusual result out of doing it over and over and over again, okay? You certainly can't throw away the other 19 results that were not significant. Kind of as silly as that sounds, it happens all the time where, like, in medical trials, people will run many, many different experiments the medicine didn't work this time, the medicine didn't work this time, the medicine didn't work this time. Oh, so look, suddenly the medicine worked. I got a p-value of less than 5%, and that's the one that they report, which is really a misuse of statistics, and it's kind of unethical, right? Because we would expect just something to happen by random chance about 5% of the time. So if it happens multiple times, you can't suddenly throw away the other ones and just focus it on that one result. Um, this is actually one of the big kind of misuses of statistics, especially having to do with like the medical community or the scientific community. Um, and that really kind of wraps up uh, section 11.3.